Hey, it's Kathy with Rocky Retirement. And as promised, today's Friday, and so you'll be getting to listen to Henry Shapiro's Retired Excited. I know you're just going to love this as much as I do. And don't forget, you can still listen to Rock Your Retirement, where I'm the host, and those shows are released on Mondays. Welcome to the Retired Excited Podcast. Retired Excited, the show where we give retired and want to be retired folk a look at how great retired life can be. Here we talk to men and women who are happily retired and loving their life. We explore the techniques, activities, beliefs, and excitement of these happy retirees and examine how every Tom, Dick, and Mary can benefit from their experience. Together, we will delve into what retired happiness really looks like and how anyone can achieve it. Here is your host, Henry Shapiro. Hey folks, Henry here at Retired Excited, the show providing inspiration for people who are nearly retired, newly retired, or say they're never going to retire. If you're nearing retirement and fearful of what lies ahead, you don't need to be. If you're already retired and wondering how to fill your days, then this show is exactly for you. Here we talk to retired people doing things that make them happy. Things from stamp collecting to cruising, from dancing to touring the world on a motorbike. There's an exciting stage of life to be enjoyed after full-time work and it's got nothing to do with your financial situation or social position. We talk to everyday retired people who are living the life they want and we talk to a few professionals to get expert advice. And I chip in with some of my own experiences. Hey there folks, Henry here. Today at Retired Excited, where we talk to issues that are of interest to nearly retired, newly retired, and folks who say they're never going to retire. We provide the inspiration for an excellent retirement. Today I'm speaking to Caroline Hogg, and as you'll hear, Caroline is a longtime friend and has had an incredible career. She began as a teacher and then later became a parliamentarian. She's held three major portfolios as a minister and was responsible for budgets of billions of dollars. Although this podcast is about retirement and what happens around the the period when you retire, and more particularly after you retire, I spent quite a bit of time talking to Caroline about her parliamentary career, and I did that for a reason. As a general perception, I think in, in most communities that most parliamentarians are useless blackguards who don't deserve the money that they earn, who don't necessarily do the right thing for their community, who are out of touch with the ordinary person. And so I spent that time with Caroline to just explain to people and and let you get a first-hand indication of what parliamentarians really do, what their life is really like, particularly when they become ministers. As you'll hear, Caroline is a highly disciplined person. And that was a requirement, really, for when she was in Parliament, but she's carried that over into her private life after retirement, I want you to take note of how Caroline handled her retirement. What happened around the time that she retired and how she planned for it, looked at it, what her reaction was, and what's happened now. Since she retired, she's been busier than ever. That may not be typical for most people, but it may be for you, depending on what your work is. She's a committed kind of a person, and she carried the skills of her workplace in Parliament over into her private life, her retired life. And now, nine years later, Caroline's able to step back and relax a bit and start yet another phase of her life. So, here we are today. We are at Caroline Hogg's house in the inner suburbs of Melbourne. Hi there, Caroline. How are you today? Hi, Henry. Fine, thank you. It is a lovely day today. Dreadful day yesterday. Uh, Well, a very hot day yesterday, a cooler day today. So a day we prefer. We older people. We older people. 41.6 degrees yesterday, Mm -hmm. which for those folks in America is about 107 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. That's hot, isn't it? We remember Fahrenheit. (laughs) (laughs) We're old enough to remember Fahrenheit. I want to start off just by a bit of your backstory. I should tell the listeners that I've known you for a very long time. 40 plus years, I guess. 40 plus Mm -hmm. years. That's right. So I've known you all that time, so the listeners haven't. 
And perhaps we'll start the backstory with the fact that you were a politician. Because going back, well, before that you were a I was teacher, a school teacher, a school teacher for a very you. long time. Yeah, I was. Yes, I yes, was. Yes. When I first met you, I was teaching just up the road at a high school. Mm-hmm. And I stayed there for a total of 14 years, in fact, and didn't go into um, state politics, the state legislature, until 1982, which was a, quite a time after I'd met you, Henry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what was that, 17 years in Parliament? Something like that? I, yes, I was 17 and a half years in Parliament. That's true. I finished in 1999. Well, let's go back to the start. When you say you were a teacher, what age were the kids? How, how old were the kids you were teaching? Uh, they were high school age, so they varied between 12 and 18. And what topics were you teaching? And I mostly Subjects? taught middle, middle uh, years, so they were 14 to 16. I taught English and I taught French and I taught a few other little useful subjects in between. <laughs> <laughs> I fill it in. So then if we move on to your entry into Parliament, how did that happen? I was very active in the Australian Labor Party, which is like the um, British Labor Party a bit, or the, the Democrats in the United States. It's a party on the left. And I had been, for many years, a member of the Labor Party and had worked in local government. I'd been a councillor. For, for my local council and community and enjoyed that very much. After thinking that I wouldn't, I ended up enjoying that and I was there for nine years in local government. I had no intention at all of doing anything other than going on teaching and learning some languages, really by accident, much more than by design, certainly by accident. Um, I was pre-selected for a very safe, we call it upper house seat, Uh, There are two chambers in the Victorian Parliament and the Upper House um, is the second chamber where the Premier and the Treasurer really cannot be but various other Ministers can be members of the Upper House. Um, And um, I was elected to a very safe Upper House seat and I stayed there for nearly 18 years. Well, you finished up being a Minister. Yes, I did. And not just a Minister in one portfolio but a number of portfolios and at times what today would be, presiding over budgets of billions of dollars. Oh, yes. And indeed, indeed at the time, they were huge budgets. I was elected in 1982. I became a minister, which was when the Labor government was elected. I became a minister in 1985 and remained one until the Labor government was voted out in 92. So that was seven years of of 24-7 work, (laughs) I have to say. And I had carriage of virtually all the human service portfolios, a lot of them at the same time. Um, So I was minister for the big portfolios, community services, not regarded as so big, but perhaps the most delicate, touchy, painful of all portfolios, minister for education, minister for health, and lots of other smaller ones. Mm, I'm going to come back to it was hard work, but let me first ask you, what was the best thing about being in Parliament? I, there were very few good things about being in Parliament itself. There were a lot of good things about being in government. Um, being in government meant you could actually do things, initiate programs if there was enough money, uh, sometimes just fix small problems by a personal intervention. Um, those were the best things about being in Parliament. And on, the other, the, on the other side, what, what are the worst things? <laughs> oh, well, the worst things about being in Parliament was Parliament itself, probably, which is adversarial, and uh, um, I was also in Parliament for, for seven years of opposition before I, before I finished up, and that was just soul-destroying and exhausting, as a lot of the things that we thought were pretty good and had put in place during a period of Labor government were unpicked, demolished. And at a personal level... What was the best thing for you personally about being in Parliament? What what was the best thing you did, perhaps? Um, I actually think the best thing that I did, which was really my idea and which we managed to bring to fruition, was the following. Um, The department that I administered, which was community services, had taken over responsibility for child protection and as would be the case in every country in the world 
child protection reporting, that is the reporting of child protection concerns, just went through the roof in the 1980s. Prior to that, it hadn't been much spoken of. And in fact, uh, child protection had been left to a non-government agency in Victoria with a budget of a million. It was given to a government department and minister, Minister for Community Services, and we had a quadrupled budget, $4 million. And um, Seems like a pittance today, <laughs> doesn't it? Just. <laughs> well, it seemed like a pittance by the end of that year. We took that over on, I think, the 1st of October uh, 1983, and immediately, because the, the whole prohibition about discussing um, child protection had just disappeared in that decade. So the number of cases that we had expected, and we'd actually worked through this with the union, um, quadrupled, mm -hmm. and then it was a factor of 10. Um, within three months, I had to go back to the Premier and ask for more staff. You, you more... were telling me this was the best thing. <laughs> no, I'm getting to the best thing. I'm trying to provide the context. Excellent. And uh, at the same time, I did a lot of work in the country. And it was a time in northwestern Victoria of great trouble, drought, as usual, marginal farming, privation for a lot of farmers. Now, a lot of farmers, male farmers, were actually married to women who had tertiary education, but they didn't have often the tertiary education that could be used in their communities. And it occurred to me that if we could provide a bridging course for some of these women who wanted to do it, we would have a ready-made pool of child protection workers who could get jobs in their community. Also, they'd be older because there's, again, everywhere in the world, there's the problem that child protection workers who do the most difficult of community jobs are very often the first graduates. You know, it's their first year of being a social mm. worker mm. and they have to go and make terribly fine, hard, life-threatening decisions sometimes or life-saving decisions um, when they go and visit somebody's home. So, look, with the um, assistance of a foundation on one of the universities, we actually managed to get rid of all the red tape and have an intake of country people. They were, I think, all women, country women, um, who had all got, you know, perhaps a teaching qualification or um, um, a minor nursing qualification. And they applied for this course. And all of them um, were later employed as child protection workers. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. saying they all stayed as child protection workers because retention is very difficult, and many of them went off to better paid jobs after that. But that's just an example of where the idea may have come from the community, I'm not sure, but I picked it up and with um, an opportunity that prevented itself, managed to get a lot of people in the one room and we said, look, this is how it could work, and it worked. I think that was actually the best, most practical thing I did. The listeners can tell just from the way you're telling the story that you are really proud. Well, I am pleased of, with that, yeah. yeah. What about the worst thing? What was the worst thing that happened while you were, uh, let's say, a minister? Oh, there were a lot of them. There were a lot of them. Um, the Age newspaper, which is a major newspaper at that time in Victoria, deciding that we had a crisis in cancer care or deciding we had a a crisis in emergency care, which meant an enormous amount of focus and publicity on the health portfolio. And, of course, we didn't have enough money to run the health portfolio properly, but nobody does in any country in the world. So that meant getting a submission quickly, the Premier being very sympathetic and, and at least partly helping um, in the arguments to fund that. Um, but look, there were awful single incidents, child deaths, for example. Well, I know, comes under for the... instance, I, I know there's a story about a man on a roof. Tell us that story. Ah, that man took a lot of hours out of my life. <laughs> um, he had, um, he's now dead. He um, had committed a really terrible crime. He hadn't murdered people, but he had, um, he had gravely injured them. 
and he was he was imprisoned and he was soon to be released and because he could not be found to be mentally ill and because we had changed the mental health act we had no way of keeping him in a mental health facility um he was found to have a borderline personality disorder or a personality disorder. And so that took a great deal of, of time discussing with um, the Attorney General and the Law Department and the government solicitor and the, uh, the government psychiatrist how we would categorise this person and who would, um, which department would be responsible for him. Of course, no department particularly wanted to be responsible for him as he had made terrible threats about what he'd do when he left prison, as he was inevitably going to do if we couldn't find some way of holding him. He had talked about planning a massacre in a um, store. And the people who heard him talk about this thought it was actually quite likely that he'd carry, it wasn't fantasy, you know, that he might well carry it out. So that was a terrible problem and we were caught between our own reforms really. There were no longer any sort of nice little grey corners where he could be put and held until everybody including the parole board was absolutely satisfied that he was well. And everybody had run out of all the things they could do to hold him. At any rate, eventually, much to the Attorney General's chagrin, we... Um, put through a single Act of Parliament for this person. It was a, an Act of Parliament with the man's name in it. Now this is a fairly bad precedent. It, I mean, there are, it has happened in other occasions, but no Attorney General ever wants to do this. They want to make you know, broad laws that will apply. And just, this was just, for, just, just for this guy. Just for our uh, listeners who are here in Victoria or in Australia, you can say his name, he's dead now. Yeah, who, yeah, who, who I, was I, well, I think I can yeah. say his name. He had two names, he was known, <clears throat> known by two names, either Gary David or Gary Webb. Okay. He could be found on, on, on either of those names. Um, and he was eventually, um, he eventually ended up in the Ararat facility. And I think it was in the Ararat facility that he had managed somehow or other to, um, to get on the roof one stormy night where he was threatening to jump. And... Um, Ah, you know, it caused the local community a lot of trouble. This was not how he died, by the way. He was eventually coaxed down from it. Um, but I think of the hours of bureaucratic and ministerial time that was um, locked up just in that case, in that individual. It was many hours, put it that way, it was many hours. Yeah. That was sort of personally not the worst thing, but it was, it was time consuming and it was vexing because there was no clear answer. I've taken some time with your parliamentary career and, and politics, really because most people in Australia and certainly people in America think that all pollies are crook, that they're in it for what they can get out of it, and they don't really realise the hours and the effort and the emotional strain uh, that it takes to be a politician and to make those hard decisions day by day by day. And if I come back then to uh, the hours, what was your routine when you were in, in Parliament? Well, let's say when you were a minister. Whether, how, how whether, did, whether it was a parliamentary how did the day, day How did not? the day look? Mm. It began early. Mm -hmm. and what, what's uh, early? Uh, well, I'd always have an office meeting at 8 o'clock right. in, in at the office, mm -hmm. unless I had to be in the country. The weeks would be planned out very precisely. I always kept responsibility for my own diary on the understanding that if you didn't, you lost control of your life altogether. Mm -hmm. um, and the day would be taken up with meetings, meetings with individuals, meetings with groups, meetings with interest groups going out into the community and looking, always looking, always listening and checking what was happening, which is a state minister you can do. Um, there's no excuse at all for not having checked something out because the department will sometimes say to you, oh, such and such a service should be discontinued. And you think, well, I think I might just go and check that. Hmm. Um, and 
depending on the portfolio, it was a great deal of evening work. The party also demanded a lot of evening work, that you attend branch meetings whenever you can, policy committees whenever you can. So I'd say um, if it was an ordinary ministerial working day, it would, I mean, I'd be up at six o'clock and be at my desk at eight and probably be home. Well, there was nearly always something that I had to go to, so say home between 10 and 11. But if Parliament was sitting and if I had something difficult to do, a piece of legislation to introduce, or where I knew I was going to have to make an explanation for something that had gone grossly wrong, um, I'd often be up at half past four. And I would sleep with my folder of notes beside me so that when I woke up, the first thing I could, would do would be to think, right, I've got to try and memorise this answer. Um, parliamentary sitting days were often very long. And while the Legislative Council in Victoria is not nearly as adversarial as the Legislative Assembly, it could still get pretty, pretty nasty. And I would always try to make sure I was well prepared. I was never particularly comfortable in Parliament. I was always very comfortable within community settings, but not particularly in Parliament. I didn't like the drama of it <laughs> one bit. I think you had a reputation at the time of not being adversarial, of, of trying to find consensus around things. Yep. And, uh, I think that's true. Yeah. Yep. Let's move forward. Now, you said that you, let's say, retired, certainly retired from Parliament, yep. when the Labor Party lost power. Uh, no, no, no. Actually, I retired in the year that the um, Labor Party won again. Um, okay. I um, stopped being a minister in 1992. I stayed on for another seven years because I thought I had a role in rebuilding Labor policy. I had no idea that the Labor Party was going to win in 99. However, upper house terms were six to eight years and I felt physically unable to commit to a full term. So along with several other people, um, we left halfway through, which was when a, a general election was taking place at any rate, so it didn't incur any public cost. Um, so I left in 99, um, delighted by the person who was succeeding me, who turned out to be a wonderful um, member and minister. And um, as far as I was concerned, that was it. And we went for a while to live in the country. So, in your terms, you planned your own retirement. You were able to be in control of what yes, happened. Yes, I was. I was. I was very lucky. And that's not true of a lot of, of people in Parliament, of course. They're swept in or swept out. Uh, but no, I had a very safe seat and I planned it. How did you feel as the day approached when you knew you would no longer be in Parliament? Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fantastic. I couldn't have felt better. I don't think I was actually counting the days, but, you know... Well, you can't count the days because you never know when the Premier of the day is going to call the election. Mm. But I knew it had to be sometime that year. And what was your view of what was going to happen after you left Parliament? To me, mm? I was going to live quietly. Uh, we were going to go and live in the country. I was going to see my husband's parents quite a bit. Um, we were going to see friends in the country who would come and visit us. And um, while some of that happened, really, not very much of that happened. <laughs> Let's talk. I want to go back to discipline again because I know that you you have a routine that you, that dictates, let's say, your life at the moment. Tell us what what your day looks like now. Now that you've been out of Parliament for a long time, really. Yes, I have. I've been out of Parliament for more than well for sixteen years, virtually. Um, I get up very early, at about quarter past five. Catch a tram into the city at six o'clock. Swim uh, for about an hour. And then either go off and see somebody if I need to do that or come home. So swimming is obviously an important thing. If you're putting that much effort, having to go down, catch a tram, uh, how long does it take you to get there? Well, at that time of the morning, not very long. OK. It's really only a quarter of an hour or, or, ten, or 20 minutes. 20. And I'm dropped. The tram drops me right outside the place where I swim. And I just find that for somebody with arthritis... Swimming is helpful. 
helpful. Excellent. I was going to ask you why you do it, and you yeah, do it, I do it for, for the arthritis. Yeah, I do it yeah. for the arthritis, for any health benefit that it brings. There are other exercises that would bring the same benefits, but I wouldn't enjoy them so much. And um, uh, look, f- in terms of longevity, building muscle, upper body muscle strength would be better than swimming. But swimming sort of does it, does it for me. I does think. it for you. I yeah. remember that when you were younger, you used to run. I used to run, that's true. I used to run three kilometres, two or three kilometres every morning. Mm. So obviously health is an issue. Well, I think, I think it's always been a bit of the health stuff, but it's also a little bit of time to myself, completely to myself. And that was true when I was running and the children were small. And I would plan out my day, my teaching day. And uh, even now, swimming, and I don't swim by myself all the time, just the idea of having a little bit of time to think through the day and the week. I seem to need that. I probably actually can't manage too many ideas all in the one hit. So I like to take some time to think them through. It's often said that exercise helps to keep your brain going, to sharpen your thoughts, to sharpen your brain. Are you finding that? I don't know. (laughs) I'm not aware of it having blunted significantly, but it may well be on the way to doing that. No, I don't know that I do the sort of exercise that that sharpens the brain. Um, I use it for, um, I use exercise. I'm trying to learn Indonesian, but I'm doing it very slowly and finding it actually quite difficult. So I do use it to, you know, practice numbers and things like that. I don't think you would call that sharpening the brain. Um, but I'm sure that really vigorous exercise would do that. It's interesting you say you're learning another language because you do speak a number of languages that we have in your life. Poorly, laptop. poorly, poorly. But uh, yes, I'm very interested in language learning. Mm. I'm finding Indonesian a bit frustrating because it doesn't have the, the sort of forest of grammar that German or modern Greek would present. Um, and I'm used to that. I'm used to just sort of having to learn grammar. And instead I'm not. You're also interested in literature. Mm -hmm. I know that you've been involved in uh, some judging of literary awards. That's true, and that's what actually stopped my retirement. We moved to the country and I thought, well, there's nothing happening. I'm just going to have a year of reading and resting and seeing friends and seeing family. And... A very dear friend rang me and said, I've just given your name to the Premier's literary people. Um, They're they're after a judge for the history section of the awards. And I said, Joan, that is not me. Um, You could put me down, perhaps, or they could put me down, for the novels, but for the fiction, but not history. I've never really studied history. Within about 10 minutes... The uh, Premier's Literary Awards people have rung and I'd agreed to, um, to be a judge. It involved reading more than 80 books in a Fresh. relatively relatively short time, um, over perhaps two months. It's quite a, lot of, quite a lot of work. So much so that that was not something I was ever going to volunteer for again. But it was interesting. Uh, there were three of us and we had to come to reach some kind of consensus over a number, over a, you know, four or five meetings. You you said an interesting thing. You said that's what stopped your retirement. Did you see that as being work? Oh, yes, I certainly saw it (laughs) being work. This was not reading for pleasure. Uh, Of these 80, say, 84 books, only four might have been books I had chosen myself. The um, would have chosen myself to read. The books are, um, are submitted by the editors and publishers, and a lot of them weren't very good. (laughs) (laughs) and yet I felt obliged to really read them I've heard since a lot of judges say they read three pages and if it's terrible they just chuck it in the corner I felt I couldn't do that I mean I was a novice judge to begin with and I felt well you know if somebody's gone to all the trouble of writing 300 pages I ought to at least get through most of them and I did Mm. I did most of the books I really didn't like at all and the other thing you said was that there was nothing happening now, I would, my advice to people from my own experience would be that when you retire, and I retired from uh, full-time employment, let's say, is just do nothing. Just sit and give yourself three months, six months, a year 
to let everything settle. And, yeah, that's and, what I wanted. Yeah. yeah. And so that's you moved to the country. This popped up. I'm this not sure how. Up. I'm mm. not sure how long after. No, probably May. Um, because the the awards were presented in September. We were actually away for the presentation of the awards, so pro- probably May. Um, these great books, these great boxes of books were couriered to where we were living, and all of a sudden I didn't have any time to try out new recipes or whatever. visit with Bill's parents for very long. No, that's right. Exactly. And that was... That was the only year until last year um, that I haven't had things to do. Things sought me out. I didn't seek them out. You've done lots of reading, Caroline. Are there any books that you'd like to recommend to our listeners? It's very difficult to recommend books to people who, whom you don't know. I, I find, and I would suspect that people... Um, in retirement age groups would enjoy reading. I have to say I think reading kept me sane during the most high pressured time um, when I was a minister. I always made sure I finished the day reading a few chapters of a very good book. So I think that's what I'd recommend to uh, to your listeners. Read good books. Read them deeply. Read them thoughtfully. Don't read rubbish. Life's far too short. Read good books. And what I consider a good book would not be necessarily what you consider a good book, but seek out the good travel books or the good history books, um, the good novels. Um, I suppose if I were recommending um, to people, I would say read Hilary Mantel, read Wolf Hall, read read Bring Up the Bodies, and there's a third volume about to come out. But... A lot of people might hate that. So find your own good books, but make sure you read or listen to podcasts. And you have another interest. I know you have another interest, and that's Beyond Blue. Now, most people are not going to know what that is. Would you like to talk about that? I was on the board of Beyond Blue for 10 years. I'm not any longer. Um, Beyond Blue is a mental health charity, the goals of which are combating well, communicating about and combating um, depression and anxiety. And um, I was asked to be on the board by the incoming Labor government. Uh, Remember, I finished um, Parliament in 1999 and a new Labor government came in. And in the year 2000, um, I was approached by a then minister to serve on the board of Beyond Blue as deputy chair. Um, The previous premier, the conservative premier of Victoria, was in fact heading this particular um, enterprise. Now, he was somebody that I had never had really serious difficulties with because I'd been in the upper house, he'd been in the lower house, but a lot of my colleagues had. Um, But a lot of my colleagues had. And um, I guess they thought, well, Caroline's only just out of Parliament. Um, she knows, she knows the school. She She's trustworthy. Something to do. They're probably thinking. Uh, they're probably thinking she hasn't got anything to do. I don't know. They're thinking we will give her something to do, but they certainly did. And um, because I'd been the health minister, mental health was a great interest of mine and remains so. So I, I sat on the board of Beyond Blue for ten years. And, of course, once one sits on one board, um, others come knocking. And when I talk about boards, I want to make the point these were not the big, high-paying commercial boards. These were the boards of foundations or charities. And really, the rest of my time, I spent... And I was very busy for some of the time um, on the board of the Victorian Assisted Reproductive Treatment Authority, which was... Um, which in Victoria, unlike other states, we have regulated um, the IVF industry to a large degree. Um, That also includes surrogacy these days and includes access to information about the origins of donor-conceived people. 
It's a very complicated, very sensitive field. One I was very interested in when I was health minister um, and always a bit worried about um, in that I was never sure that I really understood all its permutations. So for another 10 years or so, until last year, I was on various boards um, to do with assisted reproduction and the last board I was on was called the Patient Review Panel and it heard every application for surrogacy made in the state of Victoria and it was also the, the point of last resort for people who for a variety of, of reasons had been refused IVF treatment, assisted reproductive treatment because of a previous criminal offence. There was a great five years ago or so, there was a great widening of access to treatment in that um, gay men and lesbian women uh, were um, included, and single women, were included amongst the people who could be parties to assisted reproduction. But, but am I understanding that criminals could not? It was, depended on the offence. Did it? Was there some thought that perhaps criminality was genetic? I don't know that it was that because it depended on the offence. If, if the offence had involved children and the removal of children, because some of these people had had previous relationships and had had children, then that was really considered a barrier against the next form of treatment. Uh, and there were also some other, some other categories which generally caught people who had committed silly offences, like procuring a prostitute, you know, when they were 19 or 20 or 21. And we had very little difficulty saying, well, look, you know, nothing, you have, nothing's happened for 15 years and, you know, you've now been able to talk to your wife about this and we're, we're giving you the OK. But where children were involved, or where heavy crime was involved, no, it certainly wasn't the thought that it was genetic. It was rather how would they cope, particularly with the pressure of another child. And we did have a few cases where yeah. people in a previous relationship had had their children removed by government authorities. And now wanted IVF. To start again with yes. another partner. Mm. Tricky one. It is tricky. Mm. Yes. It is tricky. Yes. I have specialised in tricky um, issues, I suppose. And the other thing that I did, which was not tricky, was just incredibly dry, but I did it because my friend, who was the Minister for Local Government of the day, asked me to do it. I was on the Victorian Grants Commission, which um, takes the money from the Commonwealth Government and divides it up according to a formula from which one can't really uh, resile or make changes. Um, and pushes it into local government, and I was on that for nine years. So with those three interests, mental health, Beyond Blue, um, assisted reproductive technology and treatment, and the Grants Commission, I really was kept quite busy. I hadn't intended any of that. I quite enjoyed it, but when possible, I wound myself down as well. I always considered nine years to be the absolute maximum of service one could give. And in between I did other things. I mean, people asked me to speak at conferences and the like. I did that. Doesn't sound like the sort of retirement that most people would envisage. You've almost been as busy as most normal people would. Uh, in I don't day. think so. No? And I don't really, really and truly, I don't think so. But I was busy enough. And there was a lot of travel involved in the Grants Commission. My God, we drove, we drove all over Victoria all the time in a fairly small car and often met with fairly unwelcoming councils. And there was a fair bit of interstate travel with Beyond Blue. And I wasn't really up for travelling, so mm. um, I was busy in that sense, yep. In fact, I know at one stage you uh, went somewhere in a small plane, which you weren't thrilled about? I did do a trip with the Grants Commission in a small plane. And we were going to Mildura, which is remote for Victoria, but it's within Victoria. I had totally, totally, totally forgotten that all the rules that apply to air travel when going to the United States or when going to Europe or when going to Asia also apply when going to Mildura. And my absolutely wonderful 
and 40 year old pair of Solingen scissors was taken away from me. Uh, that, was a, that was a major, that was a big major game. bad day. <laughs> <laughs> Entirely my own fault. I just hadn't made the connection. All that heavy involvement now is, is behind you. You've, you've wound back. You're trying yeah. not to do all those yeah. things. What gets you excited? What gets you up in the morning now? I'm still a member of the Labor Party. So clearly I'm still interested in politics and I will be interested in the next election campaign and I'll work in that campaign. Politics gets me up in the morning. Um, family things get me up in the morning. Swimming gets me up in the morning. <laughs> but I don't think work is going to get me up in the morning ever again, mm. except for political work. Caroline, you've been very, very generous with your time, and I'd like to thank you for that. In speaking to other people about you, they describe you as being really sharp and brilliant and gracious. And I know that uh, our listeners are going to agree with that. So thank you for taking the time with us today. It's a pleasure, Henry. Well, I know I'm biased, but you've got to say, Caroline is one class act. In Parliament, she set a standard for the way she conducted herself. She didn't get herself involved in all the macho nonsense that goes on. She just attempted to do a job to the best of her ability and uh, she was admired for doing that. You'll agree, she's led a full, interesting life and a responsible life in a working career and then she's carried that on into her retirement. We didn't really talk much about reading and literature. That really is a passion for Caroline and you will have gathered that in her response to my question. What did you take away from the interview? Let me know. If you're not a Labor supporter, just put away your bias and think about what it is we're, we're talking about here. We're talking about retirement, the transition to retirement, and having a really exciting and fulfilling time in our retirement. It's just another phase of life. It's nothing to be feared. It's something to be looked forward to. A time when you can do what you want to do, when you can fulfill those dreams, perhaps, that you've been putting off for years. So leave me a comment in the section on the website. You know where it is. It's at retiredexcited.com. And this is episode six. If you've got any ideas for the show, just email me, henry at retiredexcited.com. Now, just the support services for depression that we talked about. The first one was Beyond Blue. And you can find Beyond Blue at beyondblue.org.au and their number is 1-300-22-4636. In cases of more serious emergency, and Beyond Blue is, uh, is more about depression and anxiety, self-harm, but if things are heading towards suicide or more, more diabolical outcomes, Lifeline is where you go. Lifeline is at telephone number is 131114. They're at lifeline.org.au. They have a normal service, they have a kid service, they have a suicide callback service. And if life is in danger, if life is imperiled in an immediate sense, just ring triple O. All those contacts can be found in the show notes, as always. We're meeting an interesting man next week. He is a dour Scotsman. And what he's done is turn a necessity from his early life into a passion after he retired. Be sure to listen next week. I've loved recording this episode. I hope every one of you got an insight into how other people handle their retirement, what they do in retirement, and perhaps achieve some of those things you've been looking forward to all your working life. Now's the time. See you next week. I want to get that out for sure. Um, Ian, that was terrific. That was interesting. What a good idea.